it says this may take up to 15 minutes, seconds. You are live now. It says you are live, live now. There we go. Okay. Now we just wait, I guess. Yeah. I'm curious to know, like I said, if we see this. If you open up the attendees tab, you can see, um, and then you can refresh, and it shows the the list in the top right. There's like an update button. Awesome. So it looks like we do have some people in here now. Perfect. So we are we are getting ready to rock and roll then. <laughs> yes, we are. Awesome. So it seems like everybody's starting to trickle in, guys. Um, and we're excited to have you guys here. We are kicking this thing off uh, to share a little bit about port blocking and, and USB management and some of the different benefits of doing these different things and protecting USB ports. I know for some of you guys, have, if you've ever been on a webinar before, then you know that it takes a little bit of time for everybody to start trickling to the room and everything else. It's starting to slowly trickle in. So what I want to do um, as we, we're probably just going to give them like two or three minutes to get inside of here. So real quick, here's what I, here's what I recommend. Um, you guys, real fast, I want to start off with this very rudimentary question because it'll make it really simple. What I'm going to do from our perspective is make sure that this is as engaging as possible. Um, we don't want to be talking heads, me and Joe, just sitting here chatting with you the entire time. We want this to be as engaging as possible so that you guys get the best experience. So we're going to spend a whole lot of time talking about dropping things inside of the chat. we got a couple poll questions inside of here for you guys to be able to answer. Um, and obviously just providing some information and details in regards to what we do here at Data Locker. Um, and again, looking at the security of protecting USB ports inside of your individual environments. Okay. Um, but with that being said, the very first question I want you guys to kind of engage in inside of this chat is what is your favorite ice cream flavor? So if you can put that answer to that inside the chat as we're waiting for some other people to just flow into the room, because um, I don't want to get started before everybody is actually here. Um, we got a, you know, a solid amount of numbers of people that want to be a part of this. So um, I'm going to go inside the chat. I want to see what we got going on here. Um, boom, boom, boom. We actually already got a question from John. John, yes, this actually is being recorded. So right off the top, we are recording this. You guys will get a recording inside of there. Uh, we got, oh, look at this. We got some mint chocolate chip people. Damien, the moose tracks, you are my man. There that you is go. 100%. <laughs> that is my go-to. <laughs> Peanut butter cup. Okay. Chocolate. Uh, butter pecan. Okay. Pecan. Oh, you're a pecan or pecan person. I don't know. I'm a pecan person. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee. Vanilla. Okay, we got some different stuff inside of here. Rocky Road, John, that's another great one. That's another really, really great one. Great option. I don't know. I feel like Rocky Road, if you if you look at mine, mine's is like the moose tracks, and then Rocky Road is like literally right here. Like I, it's it's it can at, on any given day be inter, interchanged inside of there. <laughs> Rocky Road's a good Nutty one. Nutty coconut. Awesome. This is good. This is good stuff. Oh, we got Indian ice cream inside of here. Okay, Bobby, switching it up a little bit. Salted caramel. That's pretty cool. Awesome. <laughs> so we got different stuff inside of here, guys. Um, that's This is really cool. I love that you guys are engaging inside of the chat because to be 100% honest, like I already mentioned, it's going to be very beneficial for you guys as we go through details, information, um, for you guys to be engaged, right? Because the more engaged that you are, the better experience you're going to receive and the more information you'll be able to retain as we go through some, uh, some of these facts, figures, and things from that perspective, right? Um, but real quick, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and get this thing rocking and rolling. Cause it looks like we have a good amount of people that's already inside of here. So the other people are just going to have to go from the recording. Okay. That's, that's just my personal opinion. So with that real quick introduction of me and Joe, um, I'm going to introduce myself and I'm gonna kick it over to Joe, but I am Eddie Thomason. I actually cover the East coast here at data locker. Um, I reside in Dover, Delaware. So um, if there's any more Delawareans, feel free to put that in the chat. I would love to know who you are. <laughs> um, and, but I am an endpoint and protection specialist. So here to just provide a little bit of insight into endpoint protection and what that looks like inside of the different environments that we've already had this conversation with uh, to see if it actually makes sense for you guys to implement some of these different teachings inside of your environments as well. But Joe, go ahead and introduce yourself as well, my man. 
<laughs> sure. Hi, I'm Joe Shope. Um, I'm a security solutions engineer here with Data Locker. Um, I live in Kansas City, so I mean, Kansas City, Midwest. That's that's where it's at. East Coast, uh, not so much. But um, and I'm here to help uh, with technical um, aspect of our solutions and how they can integrate, how they can be used uh, to assist with security concerns. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. So real quick, we got to go through the formalities, right? To let you guys know who we are and all that good stuff. Um, at Data Locker, you know, we are, we're, we're a global company. You know, we operate over, we have over four 400,000 endpoints secured over 40 countries. Um, but this is, like I said, it's just kind of the formality things of what we do. We have over 35 patents that has been issued as well as being trusted by two thirds of the Fortune 100. So um, just, just like I said, the formalities of what we do, we're very proud and we take pride in what we do ha here at Data Locker because uh, our mission, to be honest, is to be simply secure, right? We want to make sure that your environment is an environment that your data is safe, your information is safe, um, and that's what we pride ourselves on here at Data Locker. And we're headquartered in Kansas City, so that's why Joe talked about, you know, being in the Midwest and all that good stuff. Uh, but I'm still saying pro East Coast. But anyways... <laughs> Um, diving into Joe, I'm just curious, man. Like, um, tell me a little bit about some of the people that you see on the screen here. Um, some of the different partnerships that we already have and why you feel as though they're, they're partnered with us overall inside of this, this incredible space of, of security. <laughs> sure. And, and for uh, data locker, our only solutions aren't just, um, the endpoint security that is what we're going over today, but a lot of these, it ends up affecting them because, uh, there's a need for USB devices in the environment. You can't just, um, expect no USB devices to be used. Um, these organizations are looking to have security among the USB devices. And, and that's why we see them up here. Uh, there's a lot of government entities. You can see that, um, the it, disparate networks becomes a thing. Uh, where you're trying to move data between two areas and you don't have networking between the two of them. Um, some of these, it's about uh, locking down data during travel. Um, there's uh, organizations that are out here uh, moving between organizations, uh, let's say uh, a few different manufacturing plants in the, these enterprises, um, or you know, legal documents being transmitted between um, a user, uh, a client, a lawyer, a judge, the court system, the police departments, things of that nature. And then on top of all that is the ability to actually monitor all of these, um, getting the audit information, being able to see how the devices are being used, being able to track where they're being used. Those kinds of things get really, really important when you start looking at um, you know, these, these verticals that have uh, like healthcare, where you have a, a requirement to explain how the data is being used for a patient um, or financial, where um, those records are really important for um, insurance purposes and for uh, legal requirements. Absolutely. And I know, you know, from the different people that's already inside of this room, I know you guys fall into one of these these categories, one of these industries. Right. And we're going to talk a little bit more later on at the end of this call about um, becoming like doing a custom demonstration for your individual industry. Um, but for this particular purpose, we just want to basically show you guys really some of the, the high overview um, information that we know about. USB protection and, and blocking or, or, or managing and, and making sure that we're able to protect those endpoints inside of your environment, okay? So here's your first opportunity. Again, like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna keep this thing engaging, right? So the very first question I wanted to ask you guys, um, and I'm gonna actually pop up a poll, okay? For you guys to actually answer this. But here's, the, here's what I wanna know. What's your biggest concern that you've had uh, with USB ports inside of your environment, okay? So you should have just received a poll that popped up on your screen. Feel free to just select one of those answers um, because here's some of the concerns that we've seen. But also what we want to do is kind of as we go through this webinar and kind of go through different details, statistics, things from that perspective, we want to kind of make this more applicable to what you guys want to know about. Right. So um, instead of just going over everything in a broad view, if we could take some time to, to dive in deeper on these other pieces. Um, but, Joe, I'm just curious, man, from obviously that last screen that we just showed, right? And all those different industries and the different companies that we operate or, or partner with, um, what are some of, out of these four options? Is there anyone that you feel as though stands out as a front runner, as a common concern that a lot of um, organizations see inside of their environment? Sure, yeah, and and I can see the poll results coming in and it, and it kind of coincides with this as well, but uh, one of the big ones that organizations come to Data Locker with is the concern of insider threats or um, data theft, right? So um, one of the big things when you have the 
USB devices allowed in a network is they're small, uh, they're portable, uh, users can hide them in pockets, shoes, briefcases, things of that nature. Um, and then allowing them to use it may be something that's required, uh, but then it comes with that risk of um, anyone who's not supposed to be using a device could then be piggybacking in to the system, getting access to something and taking that data with them to go. Um, so that typically ends up being a, a really big one. Um, and then obviously the, another one that kind of falls along with that is the accidental data loss, right? So um, end users that are, are potentially using it in the wrong way, um, or uh, perhaps you have it available, like an organization may have USB devices available uh, for the the purpose of uh, work cases, right? And then there's a user that isn't quite trained up on things. They're putting the data in the wrong spot. They're using the wrong devices, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because it seems like from the people that's on this call, they 100% agree with you <laughs> with the polls, right? Um, it's, it's the internal threat, the data theft piece of it. But it's also, like you said, the, the next closest one is that accidental data loss, right? Um, so I'm going to end that poll. We're going to keep those results inside of there. But then moving on to um, the next thought here is basically this idea, right? The challenges that comes along with um, USB ports, right? The, the, some of the issues that typically comes up um, and this idea that 30 percent, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 37 percent of cybersecurity threats are made through removable media, Right. That's a lot of times that's why, you know, we have this idea inside of our environments of um, do we just lock down ports? Do we what, like what do we do inside of these environments? Because I think in this industry, uh, a lot of security leaders are understanding that the issues a lot of times is going to be coming from these these removable media, USB, you know, hard drives and things from that perspective as well. Right. Um, so with with that being said, I actually Joe, I want to kick this over to you to have you talk about um, that kind of diving a little bit deeper on what the people already want to know about, right? Having these threats has actually been an issue. And I kind of want to allow you to talk a little bit more about this from this perspective. <laughs> sure. And and as you can see here on the slide, we do have the, the statistic that 60% of IT personnel say that a USB device is the tool of choice they would use. Um, yep. And and this comes back to that if there's a requirement for these USB devices to be used, um, you, you have less uh, knowledge of of how they're being used necessarily, you may not be able to lock them down in the right way. Um, and that threat, obviously, with the size I had mentioned earlier, becomes a mm -hmm. much bigger deal, right? So um, in this particular circumstance, let's say uh, you have a disgruntled employee or you have um, an employee that uh, maybe they got bought out by a competitor or um, if it's government entity, it could be an opposing nation. Something of that mm -hmm. sort uh, really can drive an, an employee that you used to have some sort of trust with to do something that you wouldn't allow or wouldn't want them to do. Um, and so in this mm -hmm. particular circumstance, um, this is a really big deal. Um, and that's why uh, with the port blocker solution that we're discussing today, uh, you can provide a more stringent policy, uh, zero trust uh, audit what's being done and make sure that, mm -hmm. that how you've told your employees to use the devices is how they're going to be used. Um, and Definitely. that actually goes right into this next point here, Eddie, if you want to jump to this next one. Yep. Accidental data loss. This is another, um, they, they go hand in hand, obviously, with the insider threat. You're thinking, um, what if somebody was to do something purposefully wrong, right? Accidental data loss is just the other side of that. Maybe you have an mm -hmm. employee that um, slept through the training. Uh, maybe they were sick that day. Um, they're not paying attention to those, those security policies that you're putting into place um, on text or on boards or through email. They're not listening to that. They're not ingesting it. They're not thinking of that. And so you can see here, 70% of businesses um, have traced losses to USB flash sticks. So um, in this same circumstance where you're allowing the USB to be used, um, instead of just allowing the device to be used and then telling the user how to use it, you can help enforce that with uh, the port blocker software. You can track it with the auditing capabilities. You can make sure that what is being done with these devices is what you'd like them to be done. Absolutely. And that's, uh, you hit it right on the head, Joe. You hit it right on the head. So with that, I do want to ask that question, right? So if if that's the, some of the common challenges that we see, my curious question to you all that's here, and I'm also going to put another poll up for this as well. Um, but what solutions have you implemented for your USB ports? Okay. So real quick, you guys should see this next poll pop up on the screen and boom, it should be good to go now. Um, Feel free to start answering the, the question inside of there. But Joe, uh, we was talking a little bit about this offline. 
And I'm just curious, from your perspective, what is what are some of the most comical <laughs> solutions that people have have put to say like, hey, this is how I'm I'm blocking my ports or anything from that perspective? I, you had some funny examples, right? <laughs> and 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 obviously, when it comes to this, I mean, it's everyone's trying to do their best, and and sometimes it's just not always perfect, right? Not getting the right thing. Right. But I mean, there have been solutions I have seen. I mean, we have here, one of the options is um, like an epoxy into the USB port. Um, mm -hmm. And that um, there's there's pros and cons to that. Obviously, it's hard set. There's no, there's not a risk of a USB device getting plugged into that. Um, mm -hmm. There have been organizations that just unplug the USB power or the USB data from the motherboards. Um, but some mm -hmm. of the ones that, that really strike me is, is there's a, a like a product out on the market that's just a like a little USB rubber plug. It sits flush yeah. with the USB port. Uh, anyone with yeah. a screwdriver or with a knife, anyone who's like wanting to get rid of that, really easily could. And there are there are companies out there just. Um, I mean, I would I hate to use the word, but essentially taking advantage of um, these the IT administrators that are trying to keep these USB ports safe and secure. Um, and then ultimately, uh, that doesn't actually allow the devices to be used at all. It's it's a it's a complete blocking mechanism. Right, right. That's so true. And that's it's funny because I didn't actually think we put the we put the epoxy cement and plugs inside of there as like kind of like a joke inside the pole, but six percent of people actually use that method. So that's pretty interesting from that perspective. Um, I love the honesty from 43% of you guys saying that you don't know. That's why I'm here, right? Um, which we're we're obviously gonna dive a little bit more into that and, and the issues behind it. But it's also a good amount of people who are using group policy, right? Group policy and, and like a Windows integrated tool. So I'm sure Joe will talk a little bit more about that as we get into like the, the demo side of things. Um, but that's that's great information to know, guys. And I'm, I'm glad that we're tracking on the same on the same page here um, because this is this is really what we're going to start to dive into and start talking about to make sure that this is a, a, a good fit for everybody, right? Um, so moving on, what is, what is the solution that most people choose? They choose to lock it down, right? They just say like, Hey, we're just going to lock down all ports and make it impossible for anybody to use it. And that's usually 36% of, of what most people say. Right. Um, but there's, there's issues and concerns that comes up when you do that. Right. So like from a security perspective, I think that's the balance that everybody always wants to play inside of our environments. It's like, do you make it secure for you know, the security leaders and things inside of your organization to say like, hey, we're blocking down all ports. And then like, you don't have these concerns of malware or anything coming into your environment. But hey, wait a minute, we gotta, we still gotta keep the end users in mind. We still gotta understand how they use uh, portable drives and what that looks like and things from that perspective, right? So that's the balance that I think all of us as security professionals are trying to find inside of this space. Um, so we, we want to talk about some of those issues that just locking everything down would bring up. So Joe, I'm going to let you talk about the impact. I'm just curious, how does that impact the impact of some of those end users? Um, because, you know, a sales or, or not a, a security professional will be happy to do this, but the real impact happens in the productivity from those users. Right. So talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and you were a very um, you hit the nail on the head with that. You were talking about uh, making sure that they're available. Um, and, and as security professionals, uh, there's a thing we call the CIA triangle, right? So you want to have confidentiality, you want to have integrity, and you want to have availability. Um, and without the availability, uh, the triangle, it's not a triangle, it's just a line. So if we're talking, yeah. making sure there's no USB drives even used, you're, you're cutting off one of those elements that you're trying to balance. You're trying to make sure that you can get all of those things in the right amounts. Um, and so here's a few of the big uh, issues that come up, right? So Mm -hmm. No peripherals. Um, if, if we're blocking down USBs across the board, obviously, if there's no availability to plug in a device at all, um, you can't plug in peripherals. Let's say a new scanner needs to be used, a new printer. Um, some products they may need to use the USB port for um, that aren't even data products, right? They're, that the threat of the data loss through that product um, is not the main concern. It's the availability for that one. Um, and so losing that, that's a big halt to, to productivity. Um, no local mm -hmm. backup. So the devices by themselves, obviously, they're going to have some sort of hard drive inside. Um, we do uh, frequently see now, you know, shared storage, cloud storage, that sort of thing. Uh, but without those, let's say in an air-gapped network or in, a, in an environment where you're on the go, uh, connectivity may be problematic. Um, having mm -hmm. the ability to backup data could be really important because your hard drive crashes, all of your um, 
you know, the IPs that you have on there. Um, maybe it's a government entity and it's secret information. Uh, maybe it's HIPAA stuff. Um, there wouldn't be any local backup of that. You wouldn't be able to, to bring it back in. Um, mm -hmm. Large data storage, again, it comes to that movable workforce. Most devices now are laptops or mobile devices, and they come with a more limited storage range. So not having that USB as an extensible storage option can mm -hmm. become problematic. Um, and then right back in that next one, remote work, um, that's the same, that same concept I mentioned earlier. You're on the go. You don't have connectivity. Where do you put the data? Um, or you're on the go. Your laptop has limited storage. What if you run out? Um, multiple different challenges for remote work come into play when you're locking it all the way down. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then and obviously inside of our environments as organizations, we, we want to keep productivity at its highest peak, right? The highest possible level. So um, these are like, like Joe was just mentioning, these are some of the key ways of like locking down ports, what it actually does for productivity, right? And those are the things to keep in mind as you start to think about, okay, what is my solution to actually implementing or, or protecting my USB ports throughout my organization, right? Um, but here's here's what I say. At the end of the day, it's easier said than done, right? Like at the end of the day, when we say like, hey, we're just going to lock it down, and we can. Typically, it's, it's, it's not a, a lot physical um, activity that has to happen in order to lock all ports down. However, here's the, the backlash you typically receive, right? If you guys have any help desk, actually put this in the chat. If, you, if, you, if you're a, a securities professional and you've had any issues with making any change at all inside of your organization when it pertains to security. And you got users that started to putting help desk tickets like out the yin yang. It seemed like your your work workload went from a trickling of a few tickets to like, oh now everybody is reaching out because they have this issue with what I just made as a company standard. Say yes inside the chat, right? So if you had had to make so let me clarify that if you had to make a big change inside of your environment. You blo either block ports or something like that inside your environment. You made some significant security change. Let's say it's just either two-factor authentication, right? And now you get a whole lot of support tickets that come in from people that's just like, man, I don't want to do this, right? So put yes in the chat if you've experienced that in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> um, so that's that's one side of it, right? Your team starts to get bogged down with a lot of issues that's happening um, because of a, a decision that was made to make it more um, secure, but now your 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 security team or your help desk team, your IT team, they're less productive because they're dealing with all these things that's not allowing your organization and your security efforts to move forward. But now more so dealing with the busy work behind answering these tickets, right? But then, like Joe was mentioning on that last slide, it's a lot of issues with the productivity when it pertains to the end users and what they're using inside of their environments. I mean, we all have that one, uh, you know, that employee that's been there for 10 plus years who sits at the reception desk and, you know, all she wants to do is be able to plug in her, her little USB device. And when you take that away from her, it's like, oh, man, like all heck is broke loose inside of this environment, right? So these are things to keep in mind. And then the biggest thing, um, that we've seen is, is it creating that new challenge of, of just locking down ports as a, as a whole is scalability, right? As your company grows, some of the organizations that we work with, I mean, it's it's as small as, you know, 50 to 75 employees, but then we work with organizations with 10,000 plus, you know, hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of employees. So we look at it from that perspective, the scalability of trying to block down all those different ports with now the caveat of remote workers and things from that perspective, it makes it a very challenging um, uh, issue to try to resolve inside of your environment. Um, and I, I'm looking at it and it looks like, yes, we have issues with two-factor authentication. Yes, two-factor and MDM. So that's good. That's it's, it's good. First of all, keep the engagement going inside the chat, guys. I really do appreciate that. <laughs> um, so with that being said, Joe, Let's start talking about some of what we need to look for when it pertains to a, a port management tool, right? Um, because at this point, we shared a little bit about the challenges that is associated with protecting USB ports, right? Then we talked about like the most common thought, the most common phrase is like, hey, we're just going to lock it all down, right? Um, so now let, and we talked about the issues of why that could cause some concerns, why that could be an issue. So now we want to kind of dovetail this into talking about what makes sense, right? Like, what should we be looking for? What are some of the solutions that we should be um, asking for ourselves to actually say like, hey, this is a tool that will actually make an impact inside of my organization, right? Um, so I'm going to actually let you, I'm, I'm going to let you roll with this one because I know this is this is where you kind of geek out at. 
<laughs> I mean, to be fair, whenever it comes to technology, I'm going to geek out about uh, whatever it is, right? Um, but yeah, so there's there are a few things, and we had talked about the, those pain points, those challenges uh, when considering uh, the port management, right? So obviously, we discussed the the big big problem of blocking everything, right? It, it cuts off a yep. availability. You're not even considering that as an option. So now we're looking at bringing that back in and then and then what that looks like to an organization. Um, one mm -hmm. of the big ones is the um, end user experience, right? So um, we already discussed here, uh, you implement a new problem or, an, I mean, I'm sorry, a new solution and you come up with new problems. You have users complaining about how easy it is to set up or uh, the different applications that it now doesn't work with or um, X, Y, Z, right? The big one, when you come down to the endpoint protection, you're doing a port blocking or port management software on your endpoint, it's going to be the usability of that endpoint. Um, enterprises, all organizations, we're installing endpoint protection software for malware. We're installing endpoint protection software for data. We're doing applications for productivity. So things like, um, you know, uh, word processors, things of that nature. There's all sorts of different applications that we're expecting to run on these endpoints. And as you had mentioned earlier with the mobile workforce, these devices are getting more slimmed down, less resources available on hand. So it starts becoming a, a balancing game of whether it can even run what we're trying to make it do. Um, and it, will that even be something that you can install um, to help provide management? Um, so mm -hmm. that this first point here, uh, beefy endpoint agents, right? If they're running and they're causing that computer to slow down, that user's not gonna be happy. You're gonna have a hard time pushing it. You're gonna have a hard time helping your end uh, uh, users. And you're also just gonna have any sort of um, other top up issues that are on, on top, like just, uh, repairing of the workstations will be cumbersome. Uh, managing those workstations from a different level, paying attention to the asset. Um, those start becoming more difficult for you as an administrator because that endpoint is gonna be slow on your end as well. Um, and then the USB port control is treated as a checklist item. That's one of those, um, if we're looking at just uh, checking a box and it's not necessarily, uh, we're not looking at how well it works, um, what it does, that starts being an issue uh, with uh, the end user, right? Maybe they're not able to use the device they need to use uh, because the solution only covers a certain range. Um, things of that nature start becoming a problem. And, and that's one of the first pain points here. And uh, Eddie, if you go to the next one here. Yep. Oh, now we're looking at uh, management, right? So the first problem that we're having is uh, ease of use, um, the user's adoption, things of that nature. Now we're looking at management. And this is a really, really big one when it comes to everyone who's on this call because we're the ones that are gonna to be touching this. We're gonna to be the ones that are gonna to have to uh, enforce that policy, check on the audits. We're the ones that have to do all of this. Um, so some of these can just be a hassle. Like you can see here on this first point, there are a few uh, port blocking products that um, it takes 26 clicks to whitelist a single device. You start putting in your environment, you have 14 different possible devices, uh, that number shoots up real high. And then let's say that you do a tech refresh and you have uh, USB devices that are getting swapped out for newer models, or um, maybe an old one was discontinued, so you have to start using a new one just because you can't even get that one anymore. That's another 26 clicks each time you do that. Um, so that's that's cumbersome on management time, like the time, the resources, um, and then it's just kind of, uh, when it becomes a headache, maybe your administrators stop doing it. Maybe they're not paying attention properly. Maybe they're doing it in the worst manner, and they're, they're shirking their security a little bit to make it easier on themselves. Um, obviously, Absolutely. we wouldn't want that to happen. But it does. Exactly. Um, and then this... add real quick. Go ahead, Eddie. Yeah, I was going to add real quick. The biggest thing is like we're we got to remember that we are people of convenience, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In general, we're all creatures of convenience. So the more convenient we can make it for our end users, the more convenient we actually make it for our security leaders as well, right? Um, so what we what we can do, I, I love the point that you brought up, Joe. Um, you know, you you don't want your your security leaders to start just allowing things to slide through because it becomes a hassle to just get it done. Right. Um, so that's that's a big concern. And that's that's I wanted to highlight that because you brought that up. Um, we want to make sure that we're able to, to create that convenience inside of our environments so that it's easy for security to be a standard. Right. So go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Exactly. Didn't mean to cut you oh, off. no, that's good. Uh, that's good <laughs> points to add to that. Thanks, Eddie. Yeah. So the, the, the other one other thing here on the hassle is the. Um, the limited number of, of devices that you can whitelist. And, and and this is a main point, mainly because um, in an environment where you're allowing the devices, knowing what devices are being used is very critical. Um, so being able to whitelist and allowing it based upon a serial number um, is a very big um, 
point, that's a really big objective. So when you're yeah. limited to that number, you may have a certain number of users that you need to support and you can't reach that number. Uh, maybe that leads to you sharing devices. Um, maybe it just means that those people have to go without, uh, but that becomes a big problem for your administration as well. Absolutely. And then this last one here, um, this one's more of being able to actually get the proper features and get exactly what you need out of the product. So uh, one of the big ones here, uh, there are certain um, port blocking tools that are cloud only. Um, the cloud is great. The cloud provides a lot of availability. But as it's mentioned here in this point, air gap networks become um, one of the main points of uh, USB use. So if you're trying to allow only certain devices in a network that can't reach the cloud, um, some of the products just can't help you, right? Um, right? So that's one of the big things. And then um, support for the different operating systems becomes a big one too. Obviously, certain organizations have a requirement for uh, multiple different endpoints. It can't just be all one standardization. Um, and if you have those onesies, twosies laptops that are out there that you're not protecting at all, that those become your risk points instead of the USBs. And so you're really not taking off the risk. You're just pushing it to a different corner of your environment. Absolutely. So basically, at the end of the day, I know there's a lot of features and a lot of, um, you know, tools that are out there that communicate like, hey, we can block ports, right? There's a lot. I mean, like you guys already talked about it. Some of you guys are, are using some of the Windows integrated tools, um, some of the different options that you guys are using for management already. So there's tools out there. But here's what we've learned here at Data Locker is a lot of those tools uh, the port blocking is like a add-on. It's not a it's not a premium feature, right? It's like the, the a lot of times those tools allows you to um, have a a premier section of maybe it's air you know air gapping some type of specific data inside of your environment, and then they say, oh by the way, we can block ports as well, right? Um, where compared to what we're about to get into is a, a solution that really that's the focus of the entire. Uh, solution in itself, right? It's it, the we're I'm giving it away here a little bit, but port blocker is obviously why we're all here to have this conversation. Um, but that is the the tool itself. It does that thing very very well, and and we've listened to the concerns that we've heard even throughout this call, right, or throughout this webinar. It's a lot of issues that comes around to the ease of use and and um, allowing it to be a much. Uh, applicable, much more applicable inside of your environments and making it um, a, a simple thing to implement and use for your end users. So all those things come into play when it comes to our development team coming together and saying like, all right, well, what product, how can we solve this problem? This is an issue that we see come up all the time. How can we actually solve this problem? And I don't know if you guys are anything like me, but I'm a huge visual learner. Okay. So here's another opportunity to engage in the chat. If you're a visual person, Put in the chat right now, like yes, I I am a visual guy <laughs> or girl, and I wanna I wanna see this actually happening because the treat for you guys is we're gonna have Joe actually go through a um, like a bird's eye view of what port blocker looks like, the ease of use, the actually seeing it in action, right? Because honestly, I sometimes I like to say like, hey man, I I I just need to see stuff before I can believe it, right? Like you're telling me all this stuff that sounds good. But give me the actual look of it. And then from there, uh, we can get this <laughs> rocking and rolling, right? So with that being said, um, Joe, Joe, if you want to go ahead and, and, and just start sharing your screen to get inside of that environment. Um, sure. And I just want to encourage you guys, if you do have questions as Joe is going through these things, put it inside of the Q&A section. So then that way, at, at the end of this, we're actually going to go through and answer those questions specifically. But if you put it inside of the chat, a lot of times the question gets lost in there somewhere. So I asked you to put it inside of the Q&A section so that that way we can make sure we answer that question. Um, also, there's going to be some cool promos and things that we're going to talk about once Joe is finished as well, if you want to see it specifically inside of your environment and your use case. OK, so with that said, Joe, I'm going to turn this over to you so you can see what the heck is happening here. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to turn my video off as well so it's easy to see. You should be able to see my screen now, um, and I'm going to show, um, like uh, Eddie had mentioned, a bird's eye view of the port blocker software. In addition to that, it's going to be a little bit of the management software. These two do go hand in hand. Um, and we had mentioned a little bit in the, the previous slides about the cloud-based solution. Um, this management software um, will answer that there is an available on-prem um, 
management software installation. So that is something that you can still um, have available in those air gap networks as well. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show the endpoint agent. Um, the service runs on the uh, endpoint, and it is available for the uh, end user to view the, the dashboard here, the port blocker dashboard. Uh, there's a few things they can uh, configure about here. They can see uh, the notifications, and I will just display one of those here real quick. Um, you can see in the lower hand corner that the device was allowed through port blocker. Um, then there's also the situation of the device is going to be blocked. I'll show that real quick so you can see that as well. You just see that little pop up and you see the device. So you can kind of know that what you plugged in uh, was allowed or disallowed. Um, there are also a little bit of some other helpful things to point out here. Um, the ability to see them is something the user can configure here um, or optionally managed. Um, this is Jason saying he can't see the desktop. Okay. Um, Eddie, do you see mine here? I do see your desktop. Just but three dots. So, so do me. A, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, and I appreciate you guys letting us know because you guys are Thank saying you. the yes. screen is not sharing. I'm going to turn my screen share off. Can you turn? Let me see if I just turn. Yeah, I'm just. I'm gonna see if I can turn mine back on to see if you guys will still be able to see my screen in itself first. Can you guys still see my screen from this perspective? It is hanging. Joe, the screen is not sharing. Still dots. Can't see anything. Don't see. All right. So here's here's what I'm gonna do real fast. Okay. So yes. it looks like they Everybody can see can yours. See can you screen. turn yours off real quick and let me see if I turn yep. mine back on. Yep. At this point, can you now see this the desktop? We see yours, Eddie. Now that can see you, but not Joe. Maybe I need to add you. Good as like now. A... Yes. Okay. It looks like they can see now. Okay. Maybe we perfect, needed to turn perfect, off perfect. yours before I turned mine on. Taking it over might have been the problem. I appreciate you guys saying that. Um, uh, otherwise, it would have been kind of an awkward situation here for a little while. Um, so uh, <laughs> as I had mentioned, uh, the parts that you couldn't see here, let me just go back through those real quick. Um, so on, on the endpoint, you'll be able to see this agent running, this port blocker agent. It does run on a service, um, So, but the user can interact with it for a few different reasons. Uh, one, the notifications, which I will show again, so you can see um, of what a blocked event would look like down in the corner there, right? Or an allowed event. It's going to look the same. It's just going to say, uh, tell the user what is occurring so they know why their device isn't working or why it's not mounting, right? Um, but there's also the ability to see some other things like this little refresh button allows them to grab the newest management policy, which I'll show in a little bit is pretty helpful uh, because there's a few different reasons why um, the ease of use comes into play for this one here. Um, so one of the things that we'd like to cover here um, is, and it was already a question that was asked, is the peripherals, right? We were talking about yes. blocking everything. Peripherals becomes a problem. Um, so you, I'm going to plug in a mouse here. You'll see the event was allowed. Uh, this device is not in the policy to be allowed, and I'll show you that here in a, a short moment. But this is just a USB mouse. It has no storage. It doesn't need to be blocked because there's nothing that's a risk here, so I can just start using it right away. Um, this same uh, process would work um, as, as one of the questions was asked, like, if I plug in my cell phone, can it still charge? Uh, yes, the USB port does still work. The software is blocking the mounting of the storage partition. Um, so the main thing that's being done here is to prevent any of the data problems, right? So the main um, pain point for the users is going to be the accessibility, the usability. Uh, we're talking uh, webcams, we're talking headsets, those things, they'll flow through. They don't have the data. They don't need to, there's no risk for your organization on that. They'll get to flow right through. Um, and then like we had mentioned, that power would still be available as well. Um, here, I also want to go into management and kind of show you how that looks for the admin, right? So we have the endpoint installed with uh, Port Blocker. Um, the administrator is going to be seeing a wholly different thing, right? So they're going to be uh, living in this world of uh, what is this device using? Are they using the device appropriately? Are they plugging in things that we don't want them to plug in? And here in the audit logs, you're able to see everything I just did. You saw this USB optical mouse with the alert for the endpoint. Um, you saw the Sentry 1 device. That was the one I plugged in that was allowed. And we saw here this Cruiser Glide here is a, a blocked event. It wasn't allowed through the port blocker software. Um, again, these devices were blocked uh, by the data mounting. Um, so it prevented this uh, USB device that was for storage, but allowed the USB mouse to still work. 
Sure. And then um, let's say that uh, obviously you, you saw the the user experience. You saw how you can see how they're being used um, in an environment that you you're working in. You're going to have devices that you need to allow. You need to have devices that are going to be used, and you want to define those. So the port blocker uh, policy is a really simplistic method of dealing with that. You can see here we have all of the devices that we manage as secure devices pre-configured in here. The only thing that's not available right out of the box is the serial number. That's something that you can add. That's something that you can put in here. So it's per serial on port blocker. Uh, but let's say you have like a custom entry here. You see that I have no custom entries. So that mouse that we had mentioned earlier, it's not listed in here, but it was still allowed through. Um, this this uh, other USB device was not listed at all. And you can see that this isn't one of the ones in here yet. Um, so I can add this as one of the devices to be used. now. This is one of those big ease of use ones, but on the administrator side of things. With other software, with other port blocking management solutions, um, you're looking at adding a new device and you're looking at this data. This is, this is a very common interface to see and interact with. Some of the time, this is really easily available. You may already have a list with pre-existing ones, but let's say you have a new brand, new device. To get this information, you're plugging into the device to an endpoint, you're hopping into um, the Windows device management, you're looking for this information for the device so you can actually plug this into your port allowing software, port blocking software. Um, and that becomes a little bit cumbersome on the administrator side. We had mentioned 26 clicks in some points. Uh, for the port blocking solution, um, I'll hop right back into that audit logs where we saw what was being, or how the endpoint was being used. And from this screen, we see this one device, we can just add this one to our list. All the information for the device was recorded when it was blocked even the serial number. I'm just gonna go ahead and put in here, Joe device so that we know why this is once being added. We'll click add. That device is now in our list. So as soon as we want to add that one and allow it to be used by an endpoint, we can just come in here and see it listed. By default, it will still be blocked because um, I mean, obviously this is for blocking rather than the usability, but you can change that to read only, you can change that to full access. And once that's added, the device can then be used by that, that user the next time they have the new policy. So that I had mentioned this earlier and I was gonna come back to it. We refresh this mm -hmm. policy. It's gonna get the new update. And when I plug in the device, now we're seeing an allowed event where it's mounting to the device instead. So you can really see how the usability of the endpoint, the usability for the user experience, and then the usability from the management side is all streamlined for ease of use. And then in addition to that, the the Peripherals being allowed through where the um, risky devices, the storage devices are being blocked, makes it simple um, to adopt. Um, and then uh, we can get into this more um, at a later time, but there is the ease of deploying this out to your endpoints as well. Um, so, so one of the big things I want to highlight on this is that it really is a simple solution to still reach your, your security. Eddie, did you have Absolutely. anything to add to that? Yeah, the only the only thing I, I do want to ask because I know this is a question that we get all the time in in phone calls and, and meetings with different clients. Um, what is that the agent that goes out? Right? Is it is it a silent agent? Is it a agent that a lot like you know? How does that deployment look from not not necessarily for you to show it to us, but from the aspect of the um, the end user and how easy it is to deploy this out to an environment. That's a good question, Eddie. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the deployment can be done um, through scripts um, that allow you to customize how the policy is being applied. So you could have a separate policies for different endpoints. Um, you can deploy this out to different sections of your environment with those different policies in play uh, because you may have some parts of the organization that need it in one way versus another. Um, and you had mentioned silent agent there, and that's a good point to hammer on because we had mentioned when the endpoints become too cumbered by software, right? So we have agents that are too hefty. Um, even our port blocker agent that's very lightweight um, can be one of those resources that um, you don't necessarily need to see. Maybe the user doesn't need to see this agent on their desktop. Um, you can deploy it in a complete silent mode uh, where the agent isn't even shown to the end user. The end user won't need to see any of that, but they'll still get that blocking. They'll still get the allowing only based upon your policy. So it dials back that resource utilization just to that service instead of this user interface as well. Um, and it really helps streamline the endpoint experience with uh, keeping those bloated softwares off. Good question, Eddie. Absolutely.
I do got a question that came in from the Q&A section. It's actually a question from Mr. Matt Havlick. I don't know if you see it on your side, Joe, but I'll read it out for everybody just to be able uh, to know what we're about to answer. But he asks, uh, Matt asks, can you force encryption with policy for any devices? That is also a good question. Um, so the port blocking software is designed to allow or disallow uh, the mass storage devices from mounting to the operating system. Um, so in this particular circumstance, uh, let's say this one that I had just shown you, this one's just a, a SanDisk drive that I had found in a drawer here. Um, this one is not one of the ones that would be um, encryptable. It's not, it doesn't have its own encryption on there. It's just being allowed or disallowed through the port blocking software. Through DataLocker's other products, we do offer hardware encrypted devices, uh, but this software is focused on the allowing and disallowing of the USB ports, um, not on the encryption. So good question, Matt. Thank you. Absolutely. So I'm going to I'm going to bump you back out of here, Joe. First of oh, all. Yes. <laughs> Get my camera. Back I'm going on. to. Yep. Go ahead and share back to over here to this side. So obviously we just went through that demo. It's it, you guys can see it's, it's pretty simple what we what we do. Right. And I love it because that's that's our tagline. Right. Simply secure. We, we try to make things as simple, as easy as possible. Uh, to be, one for your securities team to be able to roll out these these uh, solutions, but two make it really simple that it's not creating a huge disrupt for your end users, right? So we try to make it as as literally as simply simple as possible in order to do that. Um, now, with that being said, here's here's what I love. I mean, from here, what we want to do is basically give you guys a couple things. The first thing, obviously, we carried a lot of information. We're coming up here on the last fifteen minutes of this call. Um, but we wanted to give you guys, like, uh, obviously it's a lot. You're going to get the recording, but this is also a, a best practice guide that we stand by here at Data Locker. So everybody that's on this call, we're just going to email this to you. Um, it's, it's an in-depth guide to kind of give you a little bit of ideas behind uh, what you can start doing now to, to secure those USB ports inside of your environment. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to share with you guys and, and make it available to you is – it's, it's a promotion, right? I mean, we're coming into the holiday season. I know we're one day away from December, but some of you guys may have already started buying stuff in you know July <laughs> for families and everything else from that perspective. But here's the promotion that we want to basically extend to you guys that's, that's here with us today is the opportunity to get 20 free port blocker licenses to test inside of your environments uh, for, for the next 30 days and, and then up to two hours of professional service for you to, for us to basically set that up, right? We're going to help you set that up inside of your environment so you can see um, exactly what's happening inside of there. I know we didn't mention this and we can talk a little bit more about this in a, in a different setting if it's of interest to you. However, um, the process of using port blocker is just an ability to, to um, log, right? And see what type of activity is happening inside of your environment, not necessarily using it to just block everything immediately. So what we've seen in some cases is people implement port blocker as an opportunity to just have a, a view, right? An actual insight into their environment of how are people using USBs in my environment? And then from there, you can start to create specific policies and strategies within Safe Console that's going to allow you to make the best policy that fits the users of your organization, right? So we didn't have time to go through that with the demo that Joe just shared because that's a lot to get into. And I just realized my video was not on. So, so with, with that being said, um, the way that you can take advantage of this, I'm actually going to pop up a, uh, where are we at? Inside of this an offers, offers thing here. I'm going to go ahead and publish it because here's what we learned. I mean, in today's world, like I said, if you, now that you guys have seen the ease of use, you've seen how simple it is to uh, deploy and or use port blocker inside of your environment. Obviously, the questions that we start to get from here, when anytime you receive any type of uh, bird's eye view of what what solution is, um, you want a more specific idea of what it looks like inside of your environment, right? So with that being said, we're offering, you know, an opportunity for you guys to just book a demo with our one of our sales engineers, as well as um, the person that will be handling your, you know, your, your account. So one of our uh, encryption specialists, whether that's on the East Coast, the West Coast, uh, or the Midwest, right, for you guys to be able to basically schedule a time and have this in-depth discussion about what exactly um, do you need port block to do inside of your environment, right? 
Um, so you can feel free to go ahead and click on that offer page that should be popped up on your screen um, and, and just book a time on the calendar, right? Whatever's going to work best for you and your team. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that the resources is there as far as the, uh, the sales engineer that's going to help you guys uh, go through that, but also the people that's going to help you have that conversation to make sure it's a good fit inside of your environment in the first place, right? Um, so with that being said, um, here's a couple things I wanted to do. So this is obviously, you still have the opportunity to book your demo. If you also just wanted to reach straight out to the sales team, you could just send an email to the sales email that you see on the screen. So that's sales at datalocker.com, okay? Um, and then from there, that's that's really the, the basis of everything, right? <laughs> I mean, Joe, I think you did an incredible job showing what Port Blocker does. Um, at the end of the day, what we're trying to figure out from you, from you all that's here still on the call is is it going to be a good fit for us to actually have a conversation about it to see if it fits inside of your actual environment, right? Um, so with that being said, I want to open it up to just questions overall because we, now we have 10 minutes left, which are, we're, we're, I think we're doing great on time, Joe, mm -hmm. <laughs> in general. So um, I'm going to open it up to questions. I think we got a few people that are inside of, got a few things that came inside of the chat. We still got the one question from Matt, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But yeah, with that, I'll give it a couple seconds to see if anybody else pops in any questions inside of the chat or inside the Q&A in itself. And then I'll let you guys at least, you know, you can have 10 minutes back to your day to get back to whatever you guys are doing. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate that everyone was, uh, you know, in the chat and, and discussing the different parts because that helps us answer those questions that um, you know, highlight your needs and, and help you get the most out of this webinar. So. Absolutely. That's good. Absolutely. So it doesn't look like we're getting any additional questions or anything that's coming in. So I'm going to call it right there. I'm, I'm going to echo what Joe just said. So I appreciate everybody who took the time to actually, you know, hear what uh, USB protection looks like and some of the concerns and challenges that comes with it. Some of the common um, solutions that a lot of people have found inside of the industry, but also understanding how you can start to implement a solution like Port Blocker to make it easier and simply secure inside of your environment. So with that, guys, we appreciate your time. Uh, this has been an incredible opportunity, and I look forward to hearing from a lot of you guys very, very soon, okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>